a question um, about explaining the other end of this, the, the um, arbitrage between the entrepreneurs' arbitrage between the bond market and the stocks market, or stock market. Um, so the way that would work is as follows. Um, the people that are willing to lend money, say, uh, say you have, uh, okay, this is the interest rate bid, five. Sorry, sorry. Five, five, five and a half. But underneath this chap is, is, is a guy at 4.9, 4.8, and above this chap is another one at 6, 6 and a quarter, 6 and a half. So just like I was crossing these people out when, you, when, you're, when you're referencing the, the floor of the interest rate, so the entrepreneur references the offer for the interest rate, and he sees, right, five and a half is good, makes my enterprise nice and profitable, whatever, and then eventually crossed out until the marginal, marginal entrepreneur is not willing to, to take that offer, basically, um, for various reasons. So, as you said in the interim, it could be because um, the return that he can get on someone else's enterprise is higher than the, the return that he can get on his enterprise, on the bonds of someone else's enterprise. So he refuses to bid up the interest rate further and put the proceeds into capital equipment, as it were. So that's the flip side. So this is the entrepreneur marginal entrepreneur and this one is the uh, marginal saver determined by is that is that clear yeah that, that part's clear okay well, i wasn't sure what you meant when you said he's arbitrage between the stock market and the bond market well, in the sense that he will take, um, he will issue bonds in order for some kind of enterprise, like a factory, or that doesn't mean that doesn't mean the stock market. We think of the stock market as the secondary market for equity. Uh, let, let me just say something here. That's that terminology is just for the sake of simplification. What it means is that there is a marginal uh, producer and interest rate goes up. The marginal producer at that point wants to retrench. Now, instead of saying that, I just uh, find it simpler to say uh, retrenching means that he does, stops maintaining equipment and if I can sell some, he will sell some. He may not be able. But when he has the cash, that he puts into the bond market because the return is higher there. So I express, I express this by saying that he is uh, selling the stock and buying the bond. And when the interest rate turns around, he finds himself in the position that he can now compete. And then he refurbishes uh, his uh, productive equipment and goes back to production and finances his, expect his expenses by selling the bond. Now, this is all too complicated to say. So just say he's selling the bond and buying the stock. But well, actually, you could do that. Yeah. You, you, well, I back, do. you, you are in the armchair, and uh, you know you you have a company which you uh, understand what it is doing, 
that then, according to the change of interest rate, you would move this kind of arbitrage. But the expression itself is just a simplification for, for this uh, process. So it's, it's happening. It's, it's, it's not a theory. It's a, a lot of... They have to, because if the producer uh, doesn't get the bond to replace his income, he's going to lose. This is, uh, I'm, I'm very surprised that this is not codified in the literature, because this arbitrage between the stock market and bond market is, is very real. So, for example, there's, from my perspective as a, as a fund manager, I would love to issue debt at the government rate and buy the equity of Unilever. A, because there's a positive yield spread, but B, because um, the return that Unilever gets upon its property, plant and equipment is higher than the, uh, the marginal cost of borrowing. So you can look at it in terms of the stock market, which I have to do. I don't actually borrow money and then set up another Unilever. I just buy the equity on the exchange. Okay? Um, so, any more questions? Philip? But I'll ask you a question to just uh, go backwards a little bit. Mm -hmm. I was a little confused by the stock of the Okay. Can you just now have a little bit Yeah. Um, what I meant by uh, this was that um, when, when you satisfy each proposition, you take an amount of that substance to satisfy that proposition. And as you satisfy each proposition, the amount of that substance that you're using to satisfy the, the aggregate of propositions is increasing. So when you sum up that aggregate, you get the stock, as it were, as it were you know, which is also termed total utility. But that's a stupid thing. That doesn't mean anything. So when it comes to stock to flow, well, you've got your stock here. And the marginal bit of water that's sort of still coming out of the pipe, as it were, is the flow, U4. So uh, you do you add them all up and then you divide it by U4. So for example, when you're sort of when you've been put on this planet and you're considering gold, for example. Now I have no idea what the propositions for gold are, but there are there seem to be infinitely many of them. And they never there's still sort of want of more. So when you aggregate all of the uh, the stocks up as each proposition of gold I think the propositions for gold would be something like, I like it, I like it, I like it, I like it, I like it. You know? <laughs> and it sort of doesn't diminish. Now, as Professor said, the reason why it doesn't diminish is not, the reason why it's gold that has that property is neither here nor there. But the point is there will be a substance on the planet which will have that property. Just like there is a, there, there's a largest number in the set of in a set of numbers, unless they're all equal. So, so, so that's that's what I meant by by that. Really. So I can uh, extract from this: if your your dribble in the pipe increases, all this stuff kind of gets less uh, important, if you will. Mm. And if there's no more water, the number of four problems may not even be met. Yeah. So exactly. that's kind of like. Yeah. A relative. Uh, that's why when it's such a common substance, if it's infinitely available, it has no real utility or what have you. Yeah. Air, you just breathe it. Yeah, yeah. So it's yeah. no economic value. So that's it's always true. within sort of a restricted supply of whatever you're considering, whatever object you're considering. You know, it's restricted. <laughs> The primary production of gold, yeah, which is about 2,500 tons. So the stocks, that's like for the water, that wouldn't be 
be your barrels of water, it would be whatever use you have for that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Water, water would be, because there's so much water around, which in a way is why gold is like water, it's probably not the best example to, to, to have done it with, but, um, I don't know, paint, maybe. But you don't have many propositions for paint apart from painting. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like or bricks, yeah, you know. Just think about the world in the desert. Yeah. It's got an, an amount, a determined amount of liter per second of water. You can add, you can subtract, at least the maximum you can extract from the world. So in that case, it's restricted. Yeah. And the only proposition that will be satisfied is the first one. You don't have enough water to satisfy any other proposition. But saying you did, and then suddenly there was a contraction in the amount of water available, which proposition gets knocked off first? It's the fourth one. Not the first one. <laughs> okay. So in some perverse way, it's the, the least important use of water that is determining its value, not the most important use of water. Just like in a chain, it's the weakest link that determines the total strength. It's not the strongest. It's not the strongest part of it. Okay. Um, any more questions? Also? You said that the video cycle comes from the, the mismatch in the time duration. Uh, as far as I know, the Austrian school states that the business cycle comes from first uh, credit expansion due to fractional user banking. Mm. Are you saying the same thing or are you stating that? Credit could expand without causing a without causing a, a contraction at the other end of it. It's it's only when the credit is taken on 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 the credit is taken on by the counterparty for a um, a duration. Well, if the person that's borrowing it intends to let's say finish his enterprise at the end of six years. If he takes one year money to finance it, but it will only be liquidated at the end of the sixth year, that's what causes the cycle in the sense that that one year money can be withdrawn at any period within that six years. And he'll have to liquidate whatever he's built if he can't get, the, uh, if he can't get the, someone to refinance the money. Now, it doesn't matter, per se, the nominal amount he was borrowing. He could be borrowing a gargantuan amount. But if he's got it matched, and he's sure that he'll be able to liquidate the liability, and especially because the liability has a maturity which is equal, sorry, which is greater than or equal to that moment when he'll sell whatever he's doing, then it will be fine. There won't be a contraction in, in economic activity. The contraction in the activity comes when you can't roll it effectively. Really. Just comment on that. They're both agreeing that it's illicit, what they, what's being done. But those guys, the Austrians, call it fractional reserve, which doesn't mean much. And he's specifically saying, because the time doesn't match, that's the reason there's, it's illicit. You see? So it's, it's digging into the... It's like the interest rate because people for some reason start to want you know higher or lower time preference uh, animal spirits no it's not animal spirits it's market stuff that arises but how and by digging into that the mechanism starts to become clear is that is that okay yeah, yeah the same thing i deposit uh, some money at the bank on a uh, deposit account the bank tends the money to a capitalist mm. after five years and I come up in one month to take my money back. There is a mis mismatch in duration mm. and the bank run and yeah. uh, okay. Yeah. So you're saying the same? Yeah. Well, um, no. No. So <laughs> far, <laughs> I've written a paper on this and gotten an awful lot of hate mail. <laughs> what the so-called options are saying is that fractional reserve banking consists of the bank lending 10 times as much as it gets 
And that fractional reserve banking per se is fraud, full stop. What Sandeep and the professor are saying, and what I've said in this paper, is that there's nothing wrong with fractional reserves per se. Fractional reserve banking is when the bank lends less than it takes in, not more. But it, it, lends, it lends more than zero, which is what the so-called full, full reserve would, would, what the Austrians believe in would require. Um, there's a problem with information mismatch, not fractional reserves. So there's, 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 there's a very big important difference here. And it ultimately comes down to, and if there's one or two people that were economically educated and they argued it, argued it all the way down to, uh, the professor pointed out that von Mises holds that a credit slip is the same thing, that a, that, a, that a credit piece of paper is the present good, just equivalent to a piece of gold. And that's, and I argue with one person all the way down to that, and that's what they believe. What they're saying is that the bank issues credit, that is money. The same as gold does money. And they refuse to make that distinction between the two. And that's, that's the root of the, uh, of the problem. Uh, uh, another very important point that so called, I think, the so called quoted is deposit uh, irregularly or something like that, which means uh, banks can lend out deposits uh, because with the, which they should actually sh shouldn't be able to because a deposit should be there on a daily basis mm -hmm. and, and by by the ability of the bank lending in a, on a longer uh, duration, this, this starts, you know. And 200 years ago, or even further back, the banks couldn't lend out this because they were just uh, a custodian for, for the gold. Well, originally, originally, if it was a, if it was a bank run by an especially... Um, mm, Noble's not the right word, but honest family, that's what they would do. Um, but uh, forgive my Italian friends here, they, that wasn't the way it was done in, 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 in Italy, you know. <laughs> From day one, they, uh, they sort of said, right, you know. But they agreed with the depositor that they would be um, doing something with the deposit, you know. No, I'm talking about at the very beginning. And then as it sort of expanded, because don't forget, the customers of banks back then were not the peasant sort of in the street. They were of a certain sort of class of people. So you can't really, you can't mess around with them too much. Otherwise, you can mess around with everyone else. But, but, but the fact that they are lent out deposits which should actually be there uh, to, to, to be to be. With it's been done from a very early period. Yeah, so this is a kind of disorder that says this is a kind of a juristic problem mm. which actually should be defined. What do you do if you go to the bank and give them a, a normal... A, a, a well, that's where your own, that's where our own education comes in, okay? People, the general populace doesn't understand this concept. They think that when you put money in a bank, it's safe. There's no risk at and all. And it's there. And it's there, and I earn money. And they don't think, hold on, how can I have access to my money whenever I want, but I still earn money on it? They don't think. So, you get, you get the banking system you deserve. <laughs> yes. Yes. That, that's the property rights issue we talked about. The mm. British, there was a jurisprudence in England that decided that when the money is deposited in the bank, it's the bank's money, and you only have a claim against it. And that's where it all started, because if, if it wasn't, that's the original sin, if you will, and then we got worse and worse and worse. Um, um, the math that I did at the beginning, <laughs> I just wanted to make the point that there is a big difference between continuous and discrete mathematics. <coughs> And don't write down the equations I wrote down already. <laughs> and there are analogies between if you have some uh, uh, an equation in continuous form, you can have the discrete version of that. And it's very easy to get from one to the other. But the dynamics of the two are not necessarily not, not necessarily related at all. So that's what I'm trying to say there. You don't need to be a, a mathematician to, to appreciate that, I hope. But uh, it's, uh, 
It's a big error that's made in economics to assume that you can use um, any form of continuous maths or calculus. Um, you can use it if there are restrictions, I suppose, as to what people can do. But in general, you can't. You know, there's no... These are deterministic processes. And um, no human activity is generally um, deterministic. Louis. I have a question on the uh, two, the two theories. Yeah. Time preference theory of interest, mm. uh, which I'm very familiar with, having been trying to as an actor. But um, the productivity theory of interest, and that was uh, there were competing schools, uh, in all sense. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah. Oh, who who was uh, who was uh, advocating? You know, who was uh, the school? Who was behind the school of productivity theory? Who? I don't know. The professor will be able to, to elaborate who the founder of... What I meant the, 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 the contrasting schools were were the time preference and the productivity school. Not that there are different productivity schools. No, 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 but um, am I right in interpreting uh, what you hope uh, that there, there were competing schools in terms of view uh, about how interest rates fall or what they what they should be. Time preference theory is well known. That's what they teach, right? Yeah. Um, both in finance and, yeah. and so forth. But productivity theory of interest, I'm not familiar with it, so I'd like to hear more about it. Um, there are lots and lots of productivity theories. <coughs> and I would say uh, most of them. But just saying, Within the Austrian school of economics, the, uh, the two big names after Menger are, of course, Ludwig von Mises and Bernbauer. Okay. Now, Bernbauer wrote a huge monograph uh, on on interest. And uh, he went through all of the multiple issues here and he classified them with activity, time preference, and there were even some other minor schools who shouldn't fit the big picture, but that's not important for our purposes. So uh, the best mind at that time, best brain, was Ben Bauer. And I mean, he really put a lot of time and what was and gave you a balanced picture. Now, uh, he had to say what he was, where he was, right? I mean, it's not enough to write a book that uses and classify various economists of activity period. But he would have to say what he was, where he was. But uh, he was very cautious. Most of his other writings on interest suggested that he was a time preference theorist. <coughs> and, Mises, and that means that he was in the company of Mises. But you see, when you write such a monograph, you have to be even handed. Yes. And he tried to be even handed with the. With the uh, productivity theory people. So he, he pointed out various uh, things where he thought the productivity theory cannot be just dismissed like Mises 
out of hand. It's just garbage. Don't touch it. It's not worth talking about it. Well, that couldn't have been uh, the approach of the Barak, who was writing theory of interest. And, uh, and in fact, he was not so sure that it's either or, black or white. And then they, they fell out. <laughs> Ludwig and Mises and Lundbauer fell out. And, and Mises was rather rude, now, if I may say so. He did not, he had no patience at all with anybody who could give, say a, a half a good word or something like that, you know, for the productivity theory. It, it was a religion to me, but it's time preference and cannot be anything else. So, uh, what I suggest, if you're interested in this question, get a copy of Wim Bauer's Theory of Interest, I think in two volumes. In English or in German? Hmm? Is no, it no, it has been translated. Oh, okay. okay. And it's, it, it's, it's a great work. I mean, even if you don't want to read it from cover to cover, you have it on your shelf for reference, because it's a marvelous, it's a marvelous uh, thing. But it's unfortunate that uh, Mises disparaged uh, I, I cast my own speech and go and talk What's, what did you say? No, 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 I was just making it. <laughs> so, uh, you can read the memoirs of the recollections, the reminiscences of Mises, and uh, so many interesting things. His relationship to Manger, his relationship to Bill Mother, and uh, and uh, his personal opinions, it all comes out very nicely. Um, any uh, any qu more questions? Uh, look, I tell you, I cannot understand that these two ideas to be put together he will ask uh, <coughs> price of Manger on the one hand and this controversy between uh, this was vicious, you know, the fight between these two schools. They would deny good friends would denounce each other in in the worst terms, you know, over that. As, as if it was a religious issue. And how close is the solution? And rather, you know, they would rather fight than sit down and say, can we sort this out somehow? You know? Because, oh, this is another thing I wanted to say, and please contradict me if you can. Suppose you read all the relevant literature and want to say, What's the definition of interest? 
Let, I mean, if you talk about interest, we have to know what we are talking about. So, name it. The, um, the, well, when I was taught, it was based fully on the um, uh, time preference theory. And therefore, interest was defined as the, um, the, the time value of money. Yeah. But Mises goes right out and say that interest, the interest rate is not the result of a market process. It's like just God imposes it on the world. And human beings have nothing to do with it. It's like the weather, you cannot influence it, and so on. Now, how many authors can you name who say, well, in order to determine what the interest rate is, you have to go to the bond market and get a quotation on the bond price, and then it's a, it's a little calculation, but the bond price and the rate of interest are in rigid mathematical uh, relationship. And that is what I call the seesaw. The kids sitting on a uh, what? Seesaw. The plank. Or and, and play seesaw. So this is the same, but it's rigid. Interest rate goes up, bond price goes down by a definite amount. And vice versa. How many authors can you name who define the rate of interest in terms of the bond price? I was looking for, I, I was desperate finding something because I thought it was too much responsibility for me to say that I'm the one and only author who defines the interest in terms of the bond price. And, you know, just say it's, it's innate, like this is about time, my friends. It's God given, it's God imposed, and so on. This is mystification. It's right there. It's a market process. Buying and selling bonds. And when I say that, it's really gold bonds, but now let's say the the rate of interest is a result of the market process, and in particular, it's the bond market which determines the rate of interest. Okay? And once you accept this very reasonable definition of interest, it falls into your lap that this controversy, its fight, this fight, just doesn't make sense. Because once it's the bond market, then bid and ask comes in. And once bid and ask is there, you have to analyze what determines the bid price, and what determines the ask price. And you discover that the, the uh, bid price is determined by the productivity of capital or marginal price, and the ask price by the uh, and I always say marginal time preference. Now Mises never says that. Mises always says time preference period because uh, he never makes, a, uh, he never points out that there are misers like Scrooge, okay, and there are prodigal sons from the Bible, okay. There are misers who would not, uh, penny pinchers, another, right? That's another. Uh, and obviously, the time preference of Scrooge, the penny pincher, uh, is not the same as the time preference of the prodigal son. 
who wants to blow his inheritance, blows it over the shortest period of time, has fun and so on, and then he's penniless, has to go back to his father and ask for his uh, forgiveness. But to say that there is just a God-imposed time preference which is yours, yours, yours and mine are the same and Scrooge is the same and public is the same. That doesn't make sense. It's like with productivity. There are more productive equipment and then less and less and less and then there is a margin. Below that they are not productive and they are not going to be used. The same here. The time preference. There are people who have very high time preference that would be uh, uh, Scrooge and then at the other end of the spectrum you find the prodigal son you see and then there is this, this spectrum and somewhere in between there is a marginal there is a, a, a I call him this fellow, the marginal bond holder, you see? His time preference is the marginal time preference. So the concept of marginal of uh, time preference is not a monolithic concept. It's like with everything else. It's uh, a part of the so we have to talk about marginal 